All right, are you ready? We have two sermons today. We call them Sermon Shorts. And the first person I'm going to invite up, let me introduce him, you to him for one minute. Dave Bryant is what I call the man. Dave Bryant is the man. Dave, Davey, serve on the eldership team with us. And the best way I can describe Dave to you is if you think of any large building, the only thing that makes a building stand up strong is the pillars that keeps it up. That's how I describe Dave. From the first time I met him, I just felt this is a man of stature. This is a man of strength. This is a man of integrity. And it's such a pleasure to have him on our eldership team. And uh, could you stand up with me, please, as we welcome Dave Bryant. All right. Yeah, please take a seat. So good morning, church. Um, A few weeks ago, David asked me to preach this weekend, and uh, almost immediately I felt the Lord leading on what he wanted me to talk about today. But as David will tell you, it kind of took a a few days for me to respond to his request. Um, I needed a little bit of encouragement from the Lord and uh, a little bit of conviction from him as well. Um... And I think part of that is because the topic I want to speak about today is a little bit controversial. Um, It's something that we always have, people have differing viewpoints on, and I'm not sure that we're going to land today on a viewpoint we can all agree is correct. On top of that, I'm probably not the most qualified member of the eldership team to be talking about this topic. And when I look out amongst all of you, I realize that I'm probably not the most qualified within the church body as a whole. But... I want to move in obedience to the Lord, so let's dive in. Let's talk about fashion. (laughs) Now, I hit my fashion peak in the 90s, all right? And I tried as much as I could to find a picture of me slaying it from back then. But unfortunately, there weren't smartphones around everywhere like there are today, so I couldn't find anything. What I was able to find is a 90s cool kid starter pack meme. So if we could throw that up there now. Yeah, some of you might remember these days. Um, <clears throat> so yeah, back then, one of my favorite outfits was started off with a pair of Jinkos. And as you can tell from the picture here, for those of you that are not familiar with them, they're pants with legs that are so wide, you can't tell the person's wearing them that has them on if they have shoes on or not. And as an added bonus, when you walked around and it was wet outside, they'd drag in the water, and the water would wick at least like halfway up to your knee and just weigh them down even more. They'd be like three times heavier than they started out. Well, I started out with the Jinkos, then I would throw on a, a T-shirt from some obscure brand because I didn't want to be too mainstream, and then I put a chain around my neck, vans on my feet, if, but you wouldn't be able to see them. Um, and then it's not up here, but a, a wallet with a chain because, you know, you never know when things are going to get crazy and a mosh pit will break out and you need to jump in. You don't want to lose your wallet in there. So it's rough trying to recover it. Um, and then to top off the overall look, you got to have the frosted tips. Now I'm going to save you the painful process of what it takes to get this look using a Walgreens, Walgreens bleach in a box kit. Um, But let me just tell you that despite sitting through two bleachings at a time um, and nearly melting my scalp off my head, the best I was able to achieve was more of a pumpkin orange. (laughs) So uh, yeah, very festive for today. So I think it's safe to say that by my appearance today, you can tell that I've embraced my dad assignment. (laughs) And gone are the days of old. I've traded in my Jinkos for something a little bit more tame. But something hasn't changed, and that's how I go about selecting an outfit for the day. The first thing that I pick out is a pair of pants. So a few weeks ago, when I was reading through Ephesians 6, there's something that hit me a little bit differently this time when I was reading through it, and that's what I'd like to share about today. So let's go to Ephesians 6, 10 through 18, where Paul is encouraging the believers to put on the full armor of God. Now, before we jump in, 
in light of Thanksgiving season, I'd first just like to say thank you to 614 on behalf of my family and I. It is honestly such a blessing to be a part of this church because I look out and I see people that are hungry for God. No matter where you're at, that's okay. Just continue to pursue him as I see so many of you doing so well. And not only do you do that, but you do it in a way that welcomes other people in to the journey. And you do that without condemning them or judging them, but saying, come on alongside me and let's go, let's dig deeper. So I just want to say thank you before I start. And I'm really excited for 614 is going. Okay. Now for Ephesians 6, 10 through 18. It says, Finally be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand, therefore, having fastened on the belt of truth, and having put on the breastplate of righteousness. And as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God, praying at all times in the Spirit, with all prayer and supplication. Now, you've probably heard this passage before, as I said, I've, I've read it many times prior to a few weeks ago. I've heard really good sermons preached on this passage. But when I read it a few weeks back, like I said, something kind of connected that hadn't before. Something stood out that I hadn't noticed. And that was the piece of equipment that Paul talks about first in the armor of God. The belt of truth. I don't know about you, but if I'm going to prepare for a battle, a belt is the last thing on my mind. I'm, I'd be looking for a shield or a sword or, you know, maybe the breastplate or the helmet, but a belt? It just didn't make sense to me. So I think to actually understand what Paul is talking about here, we need to educate ourselves a little bit about the belt of a Roman soldier. Can we bring that up? So now in the time that Paul wrote the letter to the Ephesians, which was about 60 A.D., <clears throat> the belt was known as the Baltaeus. I think I'm saying that right. My, my daughter who knows Latin is telling me that that's about right. <laughs> um, the Baltaeus not only provided a place for the Roman soldier to attach a dagger and their sword, but it also held up their tunic. Right? Romans didn't wear pants back then. They wore tunics that if they just laid as they would, they would just extend down below the soldier's knees. And you can imagine that that's fine when they're walking around, but when you're going into battle and you need to be able to run or move or get out of the way or dodge an attack, having something hanging below your knees like that is going to be pretty restrictive. It's going to stop you from moving in the way that you need to in order to achieve victory. So what they would do is the soldiers would take their tunic and they would tie it up. They would tie it up into their belt. This brought the fabric up above their knees and allowed them to move freely. They could run, they could dodge, they could react to an attack. And I think this is the first point that we can take away from this message. Just like the Balteus allows the soldier to move in freedom, the belt of truth is for our freedom. As we embrace the truth in God's word and allow his words to define and shape us, we'll be able to have victory over the lies and deception of the enemy. The more we read the word of truth, we learn that it's not just a bunch of rules that we have to try to live by. It's actually the greatest love story ever told. A story from a creator to his beloved creation. Telling us of the great lengths that God has gone through for each one of us. That he sent his son to die for our sins. And if we acknowledge him and we commit our lives to him, that he gives us the Holy Spirit. And then he calls you a son and a daughter. Now, it's not enough to, you know, at times here or there to be 
getting into truth. We need to do it consistently. And the reason is because the enemy is consistently scheming against you. The main way that the enemy attacks us is through deception. He's a liar. He's trying to convince you that you're broken, that you're weak, that you're ineffective and you're not capable. These are all lies. This is the deception of the enemy, and the antidote to deception is truth. When we hold fast to the truths in the word, we'll be able to operate in confidence and freedom, knowing who God created us to be and fulfilling the holy assignment that he's given to each of us. Now, the next piece of information I found interesting about the Bateus is it's the one piece of armor or one piece of equipment that the soldiers wore all the time. Whether they were on duty or if they were off duty, it was like the identifying marker of being a Roman soldier. So much so that it was considered a form of punishment to prevent them from wearing it. You can see that the Balteus has a main strap, which is about four to six inches wide, and hanging from that are uh, smaller leather straps that are adorned in medallions. Now they speculate that these medallions were actually purchased by the soldiers themselves. They didn't have a lot of things to spend the money they were making on, so they would purchase these medallions kind of as a show of their prominence. But they also speculate that they had a functional purpose, and that was to weigh down these leather straps. See, these stiff leather straps with the medallions adorned to them would protect the soldier from a low blow from the enemy. So what does that mean for us? Like the belt identifies the soldier, the truth is how we should be identified. Immersing ourselves in the truth of who God is and who he says we are on a continual basis will protect us from the unexpected attacks of the enemy. Now the way to do this practically is to be in the word and spend time with him daily. We need to remind ourselves through positive self-talk and through declarations of who we are and who God created us to be. I know it may sound a little bit strange, a little bit weird to try to do this, but I, was encur- I would encourage you to try it. I'd encourage you to, to speak sp- scriptural truths over yourself in the morning and see how the Lord equips you to combat the schemes of the, uh, of the enemy. Okay. The next point I'd like to discuss is in verse 14. Immediately following the belt of truth, Paul talks about the breastplate of righteousness. Now, from what I've read, the Roman breastplate was pretty heavy. They estimate that it it weighed anywhere between 20 and 30 pounds. So it was heavy because back then it needed to be strong. And they didn't have carbon fiber and Kevlar and titanium like we do today. So strength meant added weight. But the downside to that is now the soldier had to carry this weight on their shoulders. You can imagine going through a battle for hours, this would tire them out. They'd grow weary. Additionally, with the weight, the breastplate could shift around and it could expose their vital organs and, and leave them susceptible to some you know, significant trauma. But that's where the belt came in once again. So the Roman belt the Balteus would actually hold up the breastplate. It would take the weight off of the Roman soldier's shoulders. That's a tongue twister. But it would make carrying that load easier. It would also hold the breastplate in place. So when they moved around, it wouldn't shift off to the side and leave them exposed. So what can we take away from this imagery that that Paul is giving us here. The breastplate, your righteousness, protects your heart, the core of who you are. And while we can make our best effort on our own strength to live in righteousness, the weight of doing so is going to cause you to grow weary and tired. It might might cause you to shift around and to leave yourself exposed to an attack from the enemy. But again, this is where the belt of truth comes in. Living in truth will bring a sense of ease to living righteously. 
and it'll turn that righteousness into a protection against the attacks from the enemy. Okay, one last point. The word of truth in this passage is the word aletheia. And aletheia not only means truth, but it also means to embody truth or to be truthful. So the fact that the belt of aletheia supports or holds up righteousness is not only saying that our righteousness depends on Jesus, does. He's the way, the truth, and the life. But it also says that living in truthfulness holds up our righteousness. So what does it mean to live truthfully? It's simple, right? Simple and hard. (laughs) Tell the truth and act with integrity at all times. How often? And all the time. With who? With everyone. Yeah, we even need to refrain from telling the little white lies that we might tell to make our lives and interactions with others go more smoothly. The excuses you might make up that aren't truthful with your boss, your friends, your spouse, your kids. We need to refrain from those as well because it opens a path for the enemy. Early on in, the, in 614, we were fortunate to have Terry Kruger come and speak to us. What Terry talked about was giving an open door to the enemy. He warned us against walking too close to the line or or seeing how close I can get before I stumble. And he encouraged us to walk away from that line as far as we possibly can. Because see, the enemy again is the deceiver. He's going to start with something that's almost imperceptible to attack you. And that's why we need to be consistent and vigilant. If we're not, he'll grab a toehold, and eventually that toehold turns into a foothold, a leg hold, a stronghold, and a stranglehold if we let it go unchecked. But living in truthfulness is a protection against the attacks from the enemy. And in doing so, we foster an environment that not only the Holy Spirit lives within, but he thrives in. In Colossians 4, 6, the Passion Translation says, Let every word you speak be drenched with grace and tempered with truth and clarity. So let us speak with truth and grace as we yield to the Holy Spirit. So this is my prayer for each of you as well as myself today, that we would embrace and immerse ourselves in truth. That we would allow God's word to penetrate the lies that we believe about ourselves so that we'll not only discover more clearly who God is, but we'll also discover the person he created us to be, walking in freedom and fulfilling what he's called us to do. So let's go forward, acting and speaking in truth, drenched in grace. I'm going to ask... I'm going to ask Dave to just pray for us. What a good word, Dave. Just pray for us, if you don't mind. Thanks. Lord, we're just thankful to be in your presence. Lord, remind us that your presence has no bounds. Your presence isn't confined to this building. Your presence is all around us as we leave these doors, as we, we go to class, we go to work. Lord, I pray that your voice would be amplified to each one of us. Let your words penetrate any barrier, any walls that we may have put up or lies that we've believed, Lord. I pray you'd expose those lies to us, Lord. Lord, let us understand and know the truth, the truth that you have for us, the truth of love and grace and mercy. And we just thank you for your blessings, Lord. We thank you for today. And pray us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you one more time for Dave. As I said, we have two sermons today. And as these guys uh, switch over the mic, let me just take a moment to introduce you to our next speaker today. His name is Brian Popa. Anyone know Brian? 
Okay. To know Brian is to love Brian. That's the way I like to say it. And his jokes, which are always on point. Uh, Brian and Amanda joined our church literally within two months of it being started nine years ago. And it's been such a pleasure to walk a long road with the, the Popa family. There's a special place in heaven for people with four kids. And so they have joined us uh, in that place in heaven with four kids. It's very quiet in that por portion of heaven. It's wonderful. <laughs> Brian and Amanda spent a couple of years with us on the eldership team as well, um, and a few years ago felt their season was done. And I would just like to take a moment to, to publicly honor them for their time of serving with us on the team. But even more importantly, when you step down from a team like that, often it could be like, oh, where's my place now? I don't know what to do. Having that level of visibility, just want to honor them for staying with us, walking this journey with us, and uh, leading life group guest services, finance team, preaching now. They're here, they're there, they're everywhere. Can we put it, let's stand together and just uh, welcome Brian Popa. Awesome, thank you. Awesome. Good stuff. Appreciate that. Thanks, Dave. Uh, you guys can take your seat. Thanks so much. Yeah, wow. Um, yes, Dave, it's, we've been around for a while, so some of you know us and if you don't, uh, we would love to get you know uh, you more. My wife, Amanda, and I, and, and uh, gosh, so thankful to be here. Excited for this morning, and feel thankful, guys. Um, many, many, I mean, can you believe that Dave wore Jankos? Is it, you guys remember this? Some of you do, and some of you are like, I don't know what a Jenko is, but um, but but uh, some of you wear mom jeans, but are not moms. So we got to figure. No, I'm just kidding. Whoa, that cut. All right, sorry. Um, my fault. Don't go there. That was a new one. For those of you here this morning, that was a fresh joke. That was free. Um, just kidding. All good. I have a light sermon for all of you this morning. Uh, sermon short. Um, I was I was getting ready to preach in one thing, one one direction, month ago or weeks ago, and God switched it up. So that's always fun. When you get a curveball, last minute. And this it's a it's a it's a fun one. It's called "It's Time to Die." No, I'm for real. Uh, buckle up. So it sounds like a James Bond title. When I was like th thinking up, it's time to die, Jabond. Many of you were like, I've never seen a Bond movie. It's okay. Um, I think James Bond was actually canceled in the last couple of years. Or he's a woman now, right? Isn't James Bond, I think, going to be... Sorry, we've gone to... Okay, I've, I, uh, I digress. We're going in a weird... Okay. Um, but death is weird. It's time to die. Death is a weird thing. We, we don't deal with it um, until we have to at times, um, until it's... It's in front of us. And so um, in thinking a little bit about that, I, th I've, I started thinking through what, what are on my bucket list, some things that I want to accomplish, more, more lighthearted in nature, maybe to get your attention back. Um, I I'd love to try and surf someday. Are there any surfers out there, maybe? Not the Olentangy, more like the Pacific Ocean or something would be preferable, I think. Um, I'd, I'd love to go to the Masters. It's kind of a bucket list thing to walk the fairways of Augusta golfer. I feel like that would be a good, a good thing, a fun time. I, I would love to go to a, a, a Liverpool soccer match, football match, in, at Anfield. It's a big deal over in Liverpool. And guys, I will be in the stadium a week from today. How about that? It's been pretty fun. So excited for what is uh, around the corner. Get to uh, head over uh, across the pond here, uh, here, here in the next couple of days, which is cool. So, uh, two two fears of mine is I think through death as well. One of them not rational. The other, uh, yeah, probably m perhaps more rational. The first one is dying young. Uh, I think about like the impact of that. I think about um, not being there for my kids and the reality. I don't. I don't think it's real. I don't think. I, I think that fear that I've dealt with over the course of time is not from the Lord. Obviously, I think it's it's something that creeps in and. It, not crippling, but um, gets my attention, and I have to like speak truth into my life and preach to myself in that. Um, I think about dying old as a fear, and but wasting my life in that. You get you get to a point in life, and you go, man, what what happened for the last ten years or twenty years, kind of thing, right? Um, I'll be I'll be forty in a week. I know, right? I look thirty. I get it. I, I <laughs> makes sense. I look back, half my life now, I came, to, I came to Christ around 19 or 20, but half of my life now I've walked with Jesus. Man, I think about um, what, what really has been the impact, what's really been in, uh, uh, 
affected, right? What has shifted in the kingdom because of my pursuit of Jesus over two decades? I'm reading a book called The Intentional Father right now. John Tyson, awesome book. Um, one exercise that, that is outlined in, in the book is to think through what you'd want spoken at your funeral. Great exercise. Man, like dealing with, with interesting topics of like, man, when this is done, when my time is, when I've run the race and it's finished, like what do I want people to remember or know or speak over me, right? Or about my life. And I think about that for my my son or my children, and I want to make sure they're leaving my house with, like, the right characteristics and attributes and things that I want them to, 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 to live for, for example. So I've been thinking about and reflecting on what really matters. You know, what, what am I living for? What, what outcome am I pursuing? And if, and if God and, and my marriage and my family and my church and, and even caring for this world, the, the lost and the broken, if, if these things are the most important, and I think having a priority is, is really important in, in looking at that. Like, does, does my, my week reflect what is most important? And I'm realizing that in, in this reflection and in thinking through, I'm realizing that doing your best for Jesus and emulating his example and flexing our spiritual muscles and clenching our fist ready for battle, it's not it. What do you think about this? What do you think about this, this concept or difference between living for Jesus and, and Jesus living through us? And the difference, the, the shift in our mind, perhaps. Jesus, uh, sorry, Jesus, David, Jesus. Uh, David preached last week. <laughs> I, I mess that up all the time. It's so funny. Um, hilarious. It's good. David... <laughs> David preached last week uh, in Ephesians 3 on spiritual str- uh, strength. He, he, he talked about uh, being filled with the fullness of God, to know the love of Christ that surpasses all understanding. He hit on a, a surrendering concept, an approach of humility with the Lord, a posturing that I think fits really well. So I'd like to take that a step further for us this morning. If we can pull out Luke 11, if you've, if you've got your Bible, there'll be a passage up on the screen here in a second. We'll look at Luke 9, 23 and 24. Setting the stage of just the chapter as a whole here, um, Jesus is sending out the apostles, not, not disciples, but apostles, and their mission is to go out and to um, set the demonic free, to heal the sick, to preach the good news. They come back and they're astonished. They can't believe what's occurred. It's, they've... They've done what Jesus said they would do. They kind of laid down maybe what they thought, and they picked up, and and God moved through them. They return. Jesus feeds the 5,000. The disciples are still in doubt of who's going to provide food for that meal, if you guys remember the story. Um, They struggle again to kind of uh, connect the dots or have the right faith for what God's going to do. Peter then confesses that Christ is God. It's starting to click with Peter a little bit more. Jesus foretells his death his coming death, and, and then says this in Luke 9, 23, 24, Passion Translation. Dave and I are on the same Passion boat thread this morning, so that's cool. I'm more of an ESVer, but just bear with me, okay, on the Passion here. Um, Jesus said to all his followers, if you truly desire to be my disciple, you must disown your life completely. Easy. Um, embrace my cross as your own, And surrender to my ways, for if you choose self-sacrifice, giving up your lives for my glory, you will discover true life. But if you choose to keep your lives for yourselves, you will lose what you tried to keep. Deny yourself, disown yourself, as as this as this translation says. It's kind of like it's kind of lame, right? More like live for ourselves, right? Isn't that the not the mentality, right? I think. I think that this, that, you know, it's in this, in this I, I don't know if there's a, a, a concept that goes more against our culture or against, you know, the grain of, of denying yourself. It's really about how do I get ahead? What's in it for me? How can I earn? How can I, how can I build and acquire more? How can I look good? The Bible's funny, though. Jesus, his words, he, he says things like the first will be the last and the last will be the first. Weird. 
In Luke 9, if you want to save your life, you'll lose it. But whoever loses their life for Christ will save it. The scriptures tell us we must deny or die to ourselves in order that we would actually live. So my proposition here, well, not mine exactly, but it's, it's time to die. Back to the James Bond title here. It's, it's, it's time to die. It's time to repent, to follow and allow God through his spirit to fill us, to equip us, to empower us. Ephesians 2, a month or two back, we heard from Dave that it's by grace you've been saved through faith and not of your own doing. It's a gift of God. Yes and amen, right? Can't earn this. This is purely a gift. It's, it's the blood of Jesus. It's his, his life, his death, his resurrection. Absolutely. And the Bible's funny, though. Jesus' words are funny. Listen to this. Luke, Luke 14, he's talking about counting the cost of following it's going to cost you your life, perhaps. Free gift, yes, but receiving it, count the cost. He talks about in Luke 14, he says, if you're going to build a tower, what's it going to cost you to finish it? If there's a king going to battle with 10,000 soldiers and you're going up against 20,000, you better, better count the cost of what's going to happen at the end, right? Guys, there's over 2 billion Christians in the world today. Amen, this is beautiful. The church is exploding and growing now more than ever before. This didn't happen by 120 Jewish men and women being good Christians, trying, trying their best. They decided to take up their cross, to be obedient, to live is Christ and to die is gain. Not my will but yours be done. And they, they denied themselves and, and God kind of did the rest over the generations here. It's beautiful. So as we close, what do we do with this? How do we respond? How do we apply this, this kind of tough message, if I'm being honest? I think about in John 6 when Jesus is talking about eating my, my flesh and drinking my blood. People kind of freaked out on this. A little bit weird. His disciples literally responded in John 6, 60. This is hard. Who can listen to this? This is tough stuff, guys, right? Denying ourselves, like counting the cost. It's wild, right? So I'm calling us, I'm calling the church today, I think there's something for us today in this season, to respond in obedience by dying to ourselves so that we can truly live the life that God has for us. As we heard Dave talking about deception and the evil one, this, he does not want us doing this. He doesn't want us to lay down our lives, to take up our cross and follow, no matter what that means. Hmm. Worship team can probably come up here. So, as we approach the throne of grace, as we deny ourselves, as we embrace the spirit of God to live in us, there, there's a dying to self. I, wanna, I, wanna, I, hope, I hope this comes through. I hope you guys feel okay here and, and feel encouraged. But there's a dying to self and a coming to the end of ourselves that is so freeing and so refreshing. Yeah. It's not about you. Yeah. This is a great truth to land on. It doesn't t- this doesn't turn into a passive approach or a passive lifestyle where we just sit back. Lord, you, I guess you're going to do, you know, you'll figure it out and I'll be around. And um, Chantel was here, Chanel, excuse me, Chanel was here um, a week or two back talking about the prophetic and doing some ministry here, here at 614. And I loved what she said about the prophetic, about being prophetic is listening and hearing from God. And our approach in that is not just to sit back on our hands and wait for God to speak and just go, God, I hope, you know, I'll, I'm ready to receive and excited and all that stuff. But, but her, her encouragement was, same thing now for this approach of, of denying ourselves is, um, is, is to press in. Instead of sit back, press in here, right? Not a passive, a very active response as we press in and trust. So as we rest in him, he carries our burdens. As we get in alignment with him, he works in greater ways. Hmm. So I'm asking, I'm asking here in response as we, as, we, as we close, will we trust Jesus by exposing uh, him to every new situation? This isn't some like miraculous, sensational, spectacular situation or, or thing or, or event. 
talking about the day to day. I'm talking about uh, exposing Christ to every situation, every threat, every promise, every opportunity, every responsibility, problem, fear, no matter what. Let's expose Jesus and go, God, what would you do today? So I just, I, I plead, I implore you guys, let's not live lives where we look back and say, dang, I'm, dang it, and I have this regret, this missed opportunity. Let's not play games. Let's consider this morning, what is holding us back? What are you hanging on to? What needs to die? In this dying to self, there's going to be a couple things that might have to die in order to like, to not deny what, what I, I've been trying to run after. Make sense? Good news, guys. We have a helper. We're not alone in this. We have each other. Yes, please. His name is Holy Spirit, and he's a helper. Jesus gave us, empowered us with the Holy Spirit. So this morning, I'm believing that that if this message has hit you in a in a in a in the right way, in a in a new way, in a fresh way, I'm not sure. But I just, if we could close our eyes for just a moment, just give an opportunity for for anybody that's hearing this message this morning, hearing the reality of of the goodness of God, knowing that it's through Jesus' blood. that there's forgiveness of sins. Hmm. And if this, is, if this has hit you the right way and this is your first time where you thought, you know what, I, I've, I don't know if I'm all in. I don't know if I've ever confessed with my mouth or believed in my heart that Jesus is Lord. I, 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 gosh, I think today's the day and I would encourage you, today's a great day. So all eyes closed. Your Lord, if, if there's anybody here you just slip your hand up. We'd love to know. We'd love to pray with you guys. We'd love to be aware. Oh, thank you. Yep. If there's anybody there that wants to respond, just say, God, I'm tired. <laughs> I've been trying a lot. I'm weary. I'm stuck. Man, I'm going through stuff, but I just, God, I want to receive all that you have for me. If there's anybody there, just slip up your hand. Welcome, man. Lord, we just pray for, for the people that are responding in faith. We pray that you'd seal today, that today would be a, gosh, a, a different day for them. This isn't about signing up for 614, some club, some, it's not what this is about. It's about, about calling out and saying, God, I need you and I love you. I appreciate the, the fact that you love me first. Hmm. Just pray you'd stir in these folks this morning, God. You know who they are. You know their stories. We bless them in Jesus' name. The rest of us, as we close here, the opportunity is, is I don't want to say it's a, a, a turning point or a crossroads, but guys, this is a, a, a morning to respond to God's word. And it's, it might be hard. I love this church. I love that we preach fun things and encouraging things and stuff. But we're going to preach hard things at this church too. Because it's what the word of God is, right? So how, what do we do? How do we, how do we move forward? And so I just want to ask that we would reflect as I close, as, as Dave comes back up, just to think through, and I believe this is for all of us, a, a, a genuine stirring that God has and there's a greater calling for a deeper relationship for a deeper intimacy with him and so let's press into whatever that means this morning here let's res- I think there's something about responding guys I think there's something about let me get out of my chair let me take a step forward let me get down on my knees for just a minute but there's something when we respond and say God I'm gonna just trust and take a step and move in and believe that you're gonna work Love you, church. Thanks for this morning.